child. She was born March 14, 1883 in Bern. Five and a half months after Lula's birth, David left for his mission to Switzerland. She later married John Peter Alleman, November the 2nd, 1904. After five months married, Lula died from the black measles on March 21st, 1905 in Raymond, Idaho. There were no children born to this union. Marcia Kuntz Crane, David and Aunt Lou's great-granddaughter, found these two portraits in the attic of David and Aunt Lou's home, the same home in which she is now living. It is apparent that the woman is Lula Rosina at the time of her marriage. I cannot establish for sure if the man is John Peter Alleman, the man she married, or not. I have inserted a picture that I have of John Peter Alleman. I'll let you look at those and you can be the judge whether that's him or not. Eleven months after David returned to Bern, Ezra Lewis was born in, on August 14, 1887 in Bern. He was David and Aunt Lou's third son and fourth child. Ezra attended school in the building his father built on Church House Hill. He received a letter from the First Presidency asking him to attend a missionary preparation class being given at Fielding Academy. Then he received another calling him to serve in the German-Swiss mission in March of 1906. He served an honorable two years. Ezra then met his wife, Bilda Dustin, at Fielding Academy after his missionary service and married her September 29, 1910 in the Logan LDS Temple. He and Vilda drove to Logan in a single horse buggy to get married. He and Vilda farmed in several Idaho communities and for a while in Nebraska before settling in Sandy, Utah, where Ezra raised sugar beets and ran a small dairy. He sold his milk in Salt Lake City. Three months after celebrating his 75th wedding anniversary, Ezra died at age 98 and was buried in the Sandy City Cemetery. Velda Dustin Koontz died nine months after Ezra on the September 28, 1986 in Murray, Utah and was buried alongside Ezra in the Sandy City Cemetery. It was Ezra L. and his brother Oliver, both sons of David, along with Thecla Kuntz Walk, Ezra's daughter, and Miro Maxine Kuntz Blazer, Henry and Tilly's daughter, a granddaughter of David, that researched and recorded one of the first historical records of how the gospel came to the Kuntz family, along with their immigration to Burn, Idaho story. Paul Nielsen edited the history some as it was being compiled. So the earliest record we have of our Kuntz history came through the efforts of the David Kuntz family. Then on October 27, 1888, David, with Aunt Lou's blessing, married his second wife, Marin Sophia Nielsen of Mink Creek, Idaho. If David established squatter rights in Williamsburg in 1888 and started building his dairy there, Aunt Sophie was not there that summer. As David's wife, if she was there, it would have been as a hired milkmaid. Her first summer at Williamsburg as David's wife was the summer of 1889. She was six months pregnant that spring when they went to Williamsburg and later David took her to her folks' home in Mink Creek sometime in early August and she delivered her first daughter Mabel Christina there on August 15, 1889. Mabel later married Christian Bueller Jr. on February 20, 1906. 
Mabel and Christian lived in a home that was located down on the Pescadero Road, where the road turns east, across the Bear River, and goes toward Bennington. Mabel and Christian had been married about two years at the time Mabel's mother died, leaving Sophia Rebecca, the oldest girl at home, at age 16. She and Christian had 11 children. Mabel Christina died at age 44, February the 3rd, 1933, at Soda Springs, Idaho, of a ruptured appendix. All three of David and Aunt Sophia's son-in-laws came from the sons of Christian Bueller, Sr., and one of David and Aunt Lou's son-in-laws came from that same family. So a total of four son-in-laws of David Kuntz came from the Christian Bueller Sr. family. Christian Bueller Jr., David Bueller, Walter Bueller, and Jesse Joseph Bueller were all brothers. Now David was expanding, supporting, and raising two families. He and Aunt Lou had their fifth child and second daughter, Matilda Esther, on January 13, 1890 in Bern. She was called Tilly by her family. Matilda Esther later married her first cousin, Henry Daniel Kuntz, Christian and Elizabeth's ninth child and sixth son on September 24, 1910. Henry and Matilda were married after the town site of Bern was established and they purchased the first lot south of North Street on the east side of Maine and built a home there. Their lot and home in the early histories is referred to as Henry's Place. Henry farmed for employment. There were five children born to this union. Merrill Maxine Kuntz Blazer, Henry and Tilly's oldest daughter, was one of the four individuals responsible for researching and compiling the early Kuntz history with their conversion and trip to Idaho. Alan Kuntz relates the story as told by Reed, his father, of the day that Henry died. Reed, David and Aunt Sophie's 11th child and last son, who was without a mother at four months and was raised by Aunt Lou, says he felt most of his growing up years as an orphan. So he spent a lot of time in his youth at Henry and Matilda's place as she was his older sister. Reed relates that he was there the day Henry died. Reed says Matilda and the younger children had gone picking berries and were away. Henry and Reed and several others were working about the barnyard. A thunderstorm came up so Henry suggested they all go in the barn until it passed over. While in the barn, Henry started having a severe heart attack. Reed said someone told him to get on his horse and go get Tony, Henry's brother out in North Burn, which he did. Reed told Tony that Henry was having a heart attack and if he wanted to see him alive, he best come quick. Tony didn't believe Reed at first, but shortly convinced and rode over to Henry's place with Reed only to find Henry dead. Reed then rode his horse south toward Ovid to find Matilda, Henry's wife. He met her coming home from Ovid and informed her of Henry's death. Henry died July 30, 1930, leaving Matilda Esther, a widow with five children. After Henry's death, Tilly sold her place in Bern to George and Edith Kuntz and moved to Logan where she lived by boarding college students going to college. Matilda Esther later married Albert Lewis on June 28, 1935, whom she later divorced. Matilda Esther Kuntz died July 30, 1959, and she is buried alongside Henry in the Burns Cemetery. During the year of 1891, David added two sons to his family, 
David and Sophie had a son on May 11, 1891, Orson Jacob Coons, who never married and was 27 years old when he died in San Antonio, Texas on December 7, 1918. Rebecca, Orson's sister, says in her history that with the outbreak of the First World War, Orson dropped out of medical school and joined the Army to become a flight instructor. Morris Quincy tells in his history that Orson had joined the Air Force and was in San Antonio when the devastating flu epidemic of 1918 hit and he contracted the flu and died. Orson is buried in the Burns Cemetery. David and Lou had a son, Hiram Smith Coons, on November 26, 1891. Hiram went to school for eight years with his brothers and sisters on Church House Hill with John Thomas Rigby as his teacher until he was ready for high school. Hiram graduated from Montpelier High School, then attended Utah State University in Logan, Utah for a period of time. Hiram later married Leah Jacobson on January 6, 1917, when he was 26 years old. In the Manti LDS Temple, there were four children born to this union. In 1922, Hiram and Leah moved to Cedar City, Utah, where he was involved in the wood pulp business, raised livestock, and was a contractor doing construction. During the Depression, Hiram worked as the superintendent of a CC camp. Leah passed away September 5, 1962. So Hiram moved to St. George in 1964 and married Rachel Burgess Nelson August 3, 1968. Hiram passed away February 21, 1975 at the age of 83 from a heart attack at home and was buried by Leah in the Cedar City Cemetery. David and Sophia added another daughter to their family on November 2nd, 1892. Sophia Rebecca Coons was born in Bern. Rebecca says in her history that she was the first birth in Aunt Lou's new home with Sophia Strawbar, John III's wife, acting as midwife. That home, which Orlando owned for years, and the home that Marcia Kuntz Crane now lives in. Sophia Rebecca said that David wanted to name her Sophia after her mother, but because of Sophia's opposition, they agreed on the way to church for the name, naming and blessing on Sophia to appease David and Rebecca to appease Sophia. And so it was Sophia Rebecca with a lifetime nickname of Beck, which Rebecca never did care for. Becky Williams has in her possession a narrow, tall notebook that belonged to her great-grandmother, Aunt Sophia Nielsen Kuntz, in which Sophia recorded all the births and related information for all of her children as they were born. Becky has shared this information with me. Several pages have been torn out, so some of the information on some births are missing, but it gives some detail on the birth records that remain. I have entered these pages as written and as Becky transcribed them. Sophia's birth record for Rebecca says, born on Wednesday, half past eight. Sophia Rebecca Kuntz, born November the 2nd, 1892, blessed on December 1st by Bishop John Kuntz, baptized on November the 2nd, 1900 by Robert Kuntz, confirmed by Johnny Bischoff.
got married August 15, 1917. Rebecca started school in the old log building with a dirt roof across the road from Christian's home in North Burn. Alvin O. Rich taught her for the first two winters. She then finished her schooling in the new church school building built by her father on Church House Hill in Lower Burn with John Thomas Rigby as her teacher. Rebecca says that to get to school in the winter, her brothers and sisters would hook a horse to a wood, wood toboggan and all get in on in a line and the horse would drag them to school. From David and Sophia's home in Bern, or David and Aunt Lou's home in Bern, on in a toboggan to Church House Hill in Lower Bern twice a day uh, it was a long ways in the cold of winter. Rebecca's last year in district school, or the eighth grade, was the year her mother died. She didn't start that year until after her mother died in December, and she quit in April when becoming acting mother, and she moved her family back home from Aunt Lou's. Rebecca Kuntz, Blanche Kuntz, and Emma Bentz were the first to graduate from the eighth grade from the New Bern School. Rebecca was just 16 when her mother died from what they believed was appendicitis. After Mary and Sophia's, Sophia's death, both of David's families, approximately 19 people, lived in Aunt Lou's home for the rest of the winter. Because of the number of individuals and the size of the house, this situation caused some family friction, which Rebecca intended to resolve as she had promised her mother before her mother's death that she would look after the family. By spring, Sophia Rebecca had convinced her dad to let her take Aunt Sophie's family back to so Sophia's home, except for Reed, who was only four months old, and she would take care of them, which David allowed, and she did. At David's insistence, Reed, at less than one year, stayed with Aunt Lou's family. Calvin says that his mother finished the eighth grade while mothering her mother's family. Rebecca was the acting mother of her brothers and sisters from 1908 till 1917 when she married David Bueller, who she waited for until he finished serving his mission in the southern states on August 15, 1917. Again in her history, Rebecca relates that three and a half years after her mother died, her father asked her to care for his invalid Aunt Rosie Morell, who had been brought up from Logan as she was bedridden and needed constant care. She came to Bear Lake so Aunt Caddy could care for her, but after a short time, Aunt Caddy wanted to go back to Logan to do temple work, so Rebecca agreed to take her in and care for her which she did for a full year until her death on May 18, 1913. During that time, Rebecca's brother Ira, who was now 16, caught pneumonia and despite what the doctors and a trained nurse could do, died within a week of getting sick. It was just four years after his mother died. Then one day in the summer of 1916, Aunt Lou, John Kuntz III's wife, came and asked Rebecca if she would take in Johnny's wife, Mary Schmidt Kuntz, who was expecting and care for her while she was confined. Johnny and his family were out at Williamsburg and she needed to be closer to medical help if she might need it. Early in August, Mary gave birth to Dan Eugene. Rebecca says that Mary was an appreciative woman and they enjoyed having her. That summer, David started having suffering with great pain in his stomach. Aunt Lou went to Paris with those going to school there and Rebecca was looking after her father. 
By the 1st of October, they knew that he had cancer of the stomach and all the family was called home. Ulysses and Orson were in Logan going to school. David died the 24th of October 1916 at age 61 while under Rebecca's care. Rebecca said that now their burden was greater as they were all orphans. After David's death, Ulysses stayed and helped Rebecca all he could and Orson went back to Logan to finish school. In order not to be drafted, Orson decided to join the Army Air Corps, which he did, and become a flight instructor in San Antonio, Texas. The armistice was signed early in 1918, just as a terrible epidemic of influenza swept the country and Orson contracted the disease and on December 7, 1918, Orson died, and his cousin Adeline Kuntz, Christian and Caroline's daughter, a Red Cross nurse, accompanied his body back to burn for burial. Fourteen months later, Rebecca's little sister, Marcella, took very sick with a ruptured appendix and died in the Montpelier Hospital on the 19th of February, 1919, adding to the family's grief. On August 15, 1917, Rebecca married David Bueller in the Salt Lake Temple when he returned from his mission to the southern states. She and David then moved to Pescadero into a one-room log cabin located on ground David had homesteaded before his mission. Their first son, Darwin, was born in that cabin. David and Rebecca sold their homestead in Pescadero to John Peter Alleman and moved to Montpelier where their second son was born. They then bought another piece of ground in Lower Burn where their home now stands and their third son, Lorraine, was born where David farmed and she raised her family of six children and lived all but the last years of her life. Calvin remembers his mother going to her Aunt Sarah Anderson's place in Georgetown each year where she would pick raspberries right into the jars and bring them home and can them. In their later years prior to his death, David Bueller became blind, so Aunt Becky cared for him in that condition. I remember as a boy Aunt Becky leading her husband David into church by the hand as he could not see. Calvin, Rebecca's fifth child, relates of his mother that she was a faithful temple attendee, a great quilter, a longtime Relief Society president, and a great missionary for the church. Calvin relates that he was baptized on his eighth birthday, October 11th, 1933, in Bear River. And in order for that to happen, as his father David, a counselor to Bishop Parley Coons, was out of town that day, Bishop Coons retrieved Calvin from school, where Donald Welker was principal, about three in the afternoon, and with Calvin's mother and his uncle Walt, went to a previously selected spot on Bear River and his uncle Walt Bueller baptized him. Calvin, who was the valedictorian of his high school graduating class, it relates that he purchased an old wooden water well drilling rig in Boise, Idaho, and he and his father, David, took an old pickup truck and towed it to burn where he drilled water wells around the Bear Lake Valley to finance his college and medical school. Calvin drilled the artesian well on the 40 acres that is just west of the curve prior to the outlet. The flowing water was saturated with bubbles of what he called swamp gas. When trapped, that gas would ignite and burn. He thought of capturing it, using it for heating purposes, but never got that done. Calvin drilled the artesian well next to my father and mother's home in Bern when I was a small boy. While the machine was 
hammering the well, pounding down the hole. Calvin had time, and he whittled me a small wooden train. I remember the day that, at seventy feet deep, the water came bubbling up around the tool of the drill and was flowing out on top of the ground. My mother was so happy because now she had fresh water for the house and she could water her garden any time that she wanted to. On February 9, 1893, Aunt Lou gave birth to her fifth son and seventh child, Orlando Nephi, in Bern. I knew Orlando when I was a boy, and as I grew up, he told me of his serving in the First World War as a mule tender. He later married Anna Storr, who was my grandmother Hilda Storr, Kuntz's sister, and a daughter of John and Marie Vinberg Storr. Anna was born in Henry, Idaho, July 17, 1902, when the U.S. government built the dam that formed the Blackfoot Reservoir. John Storr's house was going to be covered with water in the resulting lake, so he and Marie moved their family, along with their home, to Wayan, Idaho in the fall of 1905. It was in Wayan that Aunt Anna, along with her four sisters and six brothers, attended grade school. While in Wayan on July 4, 1915, John and Marie's home burned down, leaving the family with nothing but the clothes they were wearing, which because of the holiday was their Sunday clothes. Anna says that her folks went to Soda Springs the next day and purchased enough materials to set up housekeeping and make clothes for the family. They lived in a granary and tents until November when a new house was finished. Three years later, on November 24, 1918, Anna's mother died. So in 1919, John Storr moved his family to Soda Springs so the kids could attend high school. Anna graduated from high school in 1923 and entered college at Pocatello in the fall of 1923 and studied education. She taught school for one year in Tygee, Idaho, and three years in the Red Brick School in Bern. And Anna lost her dad, John Storr, through death on May 24, 1926. While teaching at Bern, she married Orlando Nephi on May 1927. And Anna was baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints July 27, 1927, two months after her marriage. She and Uncle Orlando were sealed in the Salt Lake Temple on June 24, 1930. Aunt Anna and Uncle Orlando had two children, Donna Lee, born February 16, 1930, and Wendell Ray, born August 1, 1932. Max Storr, a nephew of Anna's, at eight years of age, joined the family in January of 1940 upon the death of his father in an automobile accident, leaving Max and his brothers and sisters orphans as his mother had died a number of years earlier. Orlando Nephi was ordained the fourth bishop of Bern Ward, December 17, 1939. Orlando served as bishop until the 3rd of June, 1951, when he was released and Delmer Kuntz was sustained the same day. At the time Uncle Orlando was ordained as bishop of Bern, he and Aunt Anna owned and lived in David and Aunt Lou's home in Bern and lived there the rest of their lives and raised their family in that home. Orlando farmed some of the original David Coons farm as well as additional land that he purchased. Joanne and I rode with Montaigne and Betty Coons over Red Pine out North Bern to Nounen. 
he told me about some of the land that Orlando owned. Back about a half a mile or less, there was a hollow one up there in the road, and it was called Rabbit Hollow, and Orlando owned property up there, the grazing land, and he broke up 20, 30 acres of, of ground and, and cultivated it and, and raised wheat, bar wheat. It was so steep, he had a, a Model M International, and he had a case uh, tra uh, combine. Uh, it had an engine on it of its own, powered it by itself. But it was a little, you know, a little, and it was so steep in a place or two he couldn't pull it with that M tractor. Up the hill. Uh, well, it was steep and sidling. Yeah. And, and he hired my dad to bring our team. He'd make a round to there, and then the, the dad would hook the the team on the front of the tractor and for about a hundred yards he'd help pull the, the, the tractor in the combine. Really? Then he'd unhook and go back and wait for him another round. Mm. Did that all day for, well it seemed like a couple of days anyway, three minutes. For years Uncle Orlando and Aunt Anna would buy 2,000 chicks each spring and raise them as friars and when they butchered them for market they would process about 200 a day. Some of Parley and Hilda's children would help during this process. One year they had the, their chicks in a chicken coop at Uncle George Kuntz's place and the chicken coop caught a fire and burned up most of their chickens and that was a heavy loss for that year. Later on when Wendell was older Orlando and his son Wendell purchased and farmed what was known as Banks Valley out south of Montpelier. Most of this land was the original homestead of William Hensley and Margaret Jane Banks and family.